I love working with Jamie. I love working with, you know, a real artist, a thinking artist who is compassionate and driven toward excellence in what he does. It inspires me. And for particularly in a film like this, where we had to go to such challenging places emotionally and psychologically, I was grateful to be working with somebody that I respect and admire. And, you know, it just it makes all the difference. I think that's the most important part of the film is like uh, if we get that across that to be in love with your woman at that time and you were black, it, you know, it was against the law, you'd die for it. So to see him walk through all of this, because, you know, you think about it, the chances of him seeing his mm -hmm. wife were slim to none. And all of a sudden when he says, I think, I think we have your wife at Candyland. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. When he says that, you know, you just see Django go like, wow, this, I'm so close. And then cut to him behind that door waiting for his woman. I mean, that's everything. What I loved about it is that you knew that putting it in the context of a Western meant that there's going to be a hero and that we're going to have an African-American hero in the pre-Civil War South. That was exciting. That's something we've mm. never seen before in this way. I mean, I think it worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. I mean, Quentin Tarantino's a genius. Do a Western uh, with the backdrop of the, uh, of the South and slavery, and uh, you're able to get it all in, you know, because mm -hmm. Spaghetti Westerns are about uh, very, very brutal, you know, bad guys and... and uh, the heroes the that heroes. saved the day. Yeah, the heroes that saved the day, so it was, it was great. Quentin has become his own genre. He's not comedy, he's not drama, he's not action, he's not romance, he's all of the above. And he somehow makes it work, and you see that played out in the music, because the music also doesn't belong to one place or one time or one sound. He's able to kind of throw it all in there. And part of it, I think, is that he's an encyclopedia of pop culture. He knows every song, every TV show, every movie, mm -hmm. and he's not afraid to have all of that knowledge and use it. Rick Ross comes to see uh, Quentin Tarantino on the set. Rick Ross's album was called God Forgives I Don't, which is a spaghetti western title. As they're talking, I'm watching them with the backdrop of, of the movie. And I said, Rick, I'm not, a, I'm not a rapper, but I feel like you should do a song for this, for this <coughs> movie soundtrack, and the song should be called 100 Black Coffins. And then about an hour or two later, I'll go to my trailer, come back. I said, I think the song should go like this. I'm not a rapper, but... I need a hundred black coffins for a hundred bad men, a hundred black graves so I can lay their ass in. I need a hundred black preachers with a black sermon to tell from a hundred black Bibles while we send them all to hell. I need a hundred black coffins. And it's really poetry because what I told them what we need to do is not do a hip hop record, but take hip hop and transport it back to that time and what it would be like if you were to say these poor poetic lines with your voice, your funk, but we, we whistle. Oh, 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 I need a hundred black coffins for a hundred bad men, a hundred. I said, I think that is what's going to make it unique because if it came from the hip-hop side and it sounded too modern, it may make it sound like, oh, they went and did no, it. So, it has to come from yeah, the work. And then his words, uh, if you get a chance to read his words, his, his second verse will make you cry. It's it's interesting to to think that you that Quentin would say he made the the film for future generations because it's true. I feel like this film bridges our history with everywhere we're going. You know, it it it's a way to understand where we've been so that we move forward differently. And it challenges our ideas about race because it's forcing us to look back. But that's the only way we move forward in the way that we're supposed to. Well, I'll talk about Kerry Washington as well. Kerry Washington, to me, is the most courageous person in this film when it comes to what she had to deal with, the, the, the quietness of her performance, uh, which I would have loved to even hear more of her. There was a situation where uh, we were shooting the scene with Reggie, and, and uh, he said, well, you got to speak or something. I can't remember what it was. She said, no, I, don't want I said, no, every time you speak, it really, really stands out because everybody else is, you know, the, the speeches. But when Kerry Washington says the German for the first time and it comes from this meek place, it was almost like a child when, when the parents say, do, do that thing, uh, ain't so-and-so-and-so. And, and she spoke German and it was so 
like meek. It was just like it was, it blew my mind when she did that. So it was some uh, uh, some gigantic performances on this. And Leonardo like DiCaprio. Being on an all star team. Yeah, and Leonardo. Psh, yeah. Come on, man. Amazing. Amazing. Sam. Amazing. <laughs> We are really lucky to have a history of working together and so trusting each other, admiring each other, loving each other, you know, having already played husband and wife in, in a big film with a strong director, we, we knew how to be there for each other. Um, whether it was, you know, having conversations on set, phone calls, texts at 3, 4 in the morning because we can't sleep because of what we have to do the next day, whatever it was, we, we were there. I mean, Jamie was such an advocate for me. and. And yeah, we were we were just there to support each other because this was an exciting ride and it was it was good to have a partner.